Before the video starts, if you guys wouldn't mind, do me a favor and check out my website, hvacrvideos.com. We got cool merch available on there. Uh, zip up hoodies, hats, and uh, I don't know if people really know too, but we also have a women's cut v-neck t-shirts. They're in the flag style shirt. So check out hvacrvideos.com for more information. Thanks so much. Why are we doing this? Well, because our unit has a head pressure control valve. Head pressure control valve is there to flood the condenser in the lower ambient temperatures when it's winter basically, okay? And it maintains, the easiest way to explain it is it maintains the head pressure at a higher head pressure. This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. Okay. Our complaint today is that our walk-in cooler uh, has a refrigerant leak. And complaint, I mean, I had a service tech here yesterday. He had to put 10 pounds of gas in the system. And uh, we did not look for the leaks yesterday. So we're gonna dig into this today, try to find the leaks. He said the coils are in really bad shape, but we need to go through it and be 100% sure that's the problem. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and start up here at the roof. Uh, this is a Kyrak refrigeration rack. You guys have seen me work on these a lot. I have quite a few restaurants that have this almost identical rack. So, um, just walking up. Of course, we're here to do a leak search, but we're still paying attention to everything. And we noticed that the condenser fan motors are cycling. I just saw those running. This one's running. These ones cycle on temperature in this rack. So you have these, uh, there's, basically a bunch of temperature clamps wired in series or no pressure control here you go it's a pressure control so it's a fan cycle control um, and they wire them in I believe series or something like that to where they can stage off different fan motors so um, this is my compressor right here this is the walk-in cooler system a uh, it's currently not running so we need to wait for it to turn back on it looks like it just shut off yeah, it just shut off because the suction line is still really cold, but it's not running. Uh, we need to wait for it to turn back on. Then what I'm going to do is uh, shut down the entire rack. But we need to wait for it to turn on because currently right now it's pumped down. Okay. And what I mean by pumped down is the liquid line solenoid valve downstairs has shut. And when it shuts, the compressor continues to pump. Okay. And it pulls all the refrigerant out of the low side and then traps it on the other side of the solenoid valve so essentially all the refrigerant is backed up from the liquid line solenoid valve downstairs all the way up the liquid line into the condenser and it's stopping uh, basically inside the compressor at the high side port and doesn't allow it to go into the low side port so if we tried to do a leak search when it's pumped down theoretically we might not find or theoretically isn't the right word but you might not find the refrigerant leak because majority of the time the leaks are downstairs uh, in the evaporator section. So you want to have the system on. So when the compressor starts up, we'll let it run for a second and then I'll shut off the breaker, okay? And it'll let the pressures in the system equalize out. Now, I could also do this by applying service gauges and equalizing out the pressures with the service gauges, but I've said this before, I'm gonna try to do a leak search without putting service fittings on everything because once you start disturbing the caps like right here and on the receiver you might uh, miss the refrigerant leak or the refrigerant leak might be at the service cap or who knows so I like when I can it doesn't always work out this way but because I know for sure there's a leak in the system I would love to do it without applying service gauges that way we can uh, um, you know check the places where we might put the service gauges to if that makes sense all right my compressor just turned on so now we're gonna come over here and turn off the compressor, okay, um, at system A, like that. And uh, we're gonna let, the so the liquid line solenoid valve downstairs is still open and the refrigerant pressures are equalizing out, meaning that there's still pressure on both sides. So all the pressure in the high side is gonna go to the low side too and it's gonna equalize out. This is gonna make my leak search a lot easier. Okay, we shut down the compressor, but I'm also gonna shut down the rest of the rack, but gotta be careful, okay? Sometimes you can't do this, all right? There's lots of equipment running off this rack. This particular rack doesn't have it anymore, but the ice machine condenser fan motors for the Hoshizaki ice machines used to come up to this rack. If I had shut this off before without shutting off the ice machines downstairs, 
the old machines would have gone off on high head pressure because there's no communication. Okay, these ice machines have since been removed from this rack because I know it, so I understand this equipment, okay? But still, I'm about to shut off all of their equipment. Walk-in cooler, beer walk-in, reach-ins, everything. So you gotta be careful. Again, keeping the customer in the loop so they know what's going on. They may see temperatures go up on the other reach-ins, but it's just temporary. All right, today I'm gonna use the Inficon Detect Stratus leak detector. And we're just gonna start leak checking on the roof and some common places where I see leaks. Now I'm on like the super mode, okay? So I'm not using cloud hunting or anything like that. And I dig how this one has a battery indicator. You guys know what I'm talking about. Actually that video where my leak detector ran out was working on that system right there. But anyways, um, okay, so we're just gonna start at the bottom of the receiver. Some common places. These service valves is why I didn't want to put service gauges on. I wanted to see if maybe it was leaking at the caps. Once I check the caps, then I don't mind putting service gauges on. So check the high pressure relief blowout thing. Nothing down below, okay. We're gonna go in some awkward spots right now up on top of here. There's a lot of dirt up here, so you gotta be careful. And I'm gonna leak check the bottom of the condenser real quick. Nothing. One thing, one, uh, bad thing I'll say about this leak detector is the, the speaker's not loud enough. It doesn't get loud enough at all. And uh, I've got it set as loud as it'll go. So that's off and that's as loud as it'll go and it's really, really quiet. Don't like that, I wish it was louder. So I'm not picking anything up here. in here. Condenser's not too bad. It's a little dirty, but certainly I've seen worse. Okay, let's look right here. Okay, nothing, nothing. So we're looking good over here. Check on the dryer. Nothing. Okay, we're looking good on this side. So we're gonna go ahead and jump over to the other side now. I didn't show you, but I checked the other side of the condenser. It's like Maybe a little bit of oil on this condenser in here, but nothing looks like it's jumping out at me saying, hey, I got leaks here. I got an exhaust fan running right next to me that's kind of drowning out the noise of the leak detector. So again, bad side is you really got to listen and pay attention to the little LED readout because it's just not loud enough. So I'm not seeing anything jumping out at me up here. Come down here. Certainly some dirt on there. It doesn't look like oil though. Pressure controls, don't ever ignore your pressure controls. I'm always check your uh, pressure controls too. These are notorious for leaking. The bellows will blow out. Nothing. So we're looking good. Um, all right, I think we're gonna have to jump down to the evaporator sections. All right, before I go downstairs, I'm gonna power everything else back on except for the compressor I'm working on. But when you had racks off or any equipment off for prolonged periods of time, you wanna stage it as you're turning it on. You don't wanna kill them, okay, with a super high inrush of uh, current. So start with the condenser fan motors. None of them start up because they're all still hooked up to the pressure controls. And we're gonna leave system A off. So we'll start with E. I usually give it a count to about 10 seconds, five to 10 seconds, and then we're gonna move on to the next compressor, okay? And just do them slowly at a time. What you'll notice too is if you've had the rack off for a very long time, this is actually another great time to check sight glasses because majority of your stuff will likely be calling now. But it sounds like that one didn't turn on, so because I haven't had this off for more than 15 minutes, so. And I'm listening, listening to stuff start up, listening to the sound of the equipment. We're just going slowly. In the summertime, this is when this really, really happens to be a problem. You notice that I have breakers. These are the old ice machine condensers that aren't being used anymore, and I have them labeled not in use. So, okay, everything's turned back on, except for the walk-in cooler. We're gonna leave the walk-in cooler off at the moment and uh, get on downstairs and start leak checking those evaporators. And just to illustrate my point, before I went downstairs, I went ahead and put my, uh, it's not R22, by the way. It doesn't matter right now, but it's 404. 
I went ahead and put my service gauges on the system. And you can see that we have, I haven't equalized anything out on my gauges. We have 88 PSI in the low side, which is great for leak searching. But because I'm done doing the leak search on the roof, I don't mind interrupting the, uh, the, the, the seals and the, the fittings and everything, right? Because I already checked everything. So I'm gonna go ahead and furthermore uh, equalize my gauges out on the roof and do a more thorough equalization, not just relying on the solenoid valve. Because I was thinking about something, so now I open the high side and the low side and the pressures are gonna be equal. But I was thinking about something. We also have a, a solenoid valve over here that probably lost power when I shut off the compressor breaker. So this time what I did was I just pulled the Molex plug out of the compressor. Um, and turn the breaker back on. So I was thinking maybe it would open that solenoid, but even still opening that and that, we still had a decent pressure differential between the two. So I went ahead and equalized it on my gauges, okay? So now compressor's not running, system's equalized, we're gonna go down and e uh, leak check the evaporator. All right, only after I equalized the system out, I shut off the fan breaker so that we were not moving air, and we're gonna start disassembling the panels and doing a leak search. Um, also, Unless you want to smell like a butthole that's been eating salad for weeks on end, um, you want to put some uh, rubber gloves on when you're working in these boxes because just the stuff, the prep table funk smell or whatever is in here and it's nasty, man. I hate getting that on my hands because it's stuck there forever. So I always try to wear rubber gloves whenever possible working on these things. All right, start at the ends. It's usually not leaking on these sides. Start at the bottom. I like to start at the bottom of the coil right down in there and see nothing and then just kind of work your way up. These leak detectors are super accurate usually, so you usually pick them up by now. Again, chasing the bottom here, and then do the same thing right here. Doesn't look like there's anything on this side, so we'll jump on over to the other side and see uh, what we can pick up over there. I uh, nicked the insulation just a little bit to get inside of it, not picking anything up in there. Checking right here, nothing. I mean, I should pull back that insulation, but I would think the leak detector would be picking something up. Again, we had to add 10 pounds of gas, so I would think it's it's either a really small leak that's been leaking for a long time, or it's a big leak. I don't think it's a big leak, but I think we would have oil build up or something. Okay, again, start on the bottom working it. Ooh, look at that. Oh, there's one already. Start over here. Don't just assume because you find one that that's all of them. Keep leak searching. We'll get some big glue on that here in a minute. Okay. So definitely right there. Let's keep going over here. These caps are notorious for leaking. Not seeing anything over here. So for for the these coils are from like 2004. They're doing pretty good. Something over here too. Yep down in there so we're gonna get some big glue all inside here let's see what we got okay so let's go get some big blue and then we'll do a leak search on the other coil remember um, so I'm using some big blue love this stuff when you're spraying it on you want a steady stream you don't want a bunch of foamy you don't want to use the fan setting the steady stream makes it easier to see leaks faster because it's just nice and smooth and if you go smooth, then typically your bubbles are gonna become the leak point. So we're gonna get right down in here, and I'll get you guys a shot of this. Right down there is where it was leaking. By spraying with a nice steady stream, you see how there's no residual bubbles left. We come down here. Let's see if I can get this for you guys. You can actually see it right there. Those are bubbles. That's our refrigerant leak. It was right up there. So what's interesting was the leak detector was picking it up on that bottom piece, but it was really the refrigerant falling from the top right there. Okay, so we're going to continue leak searching on this side too. Right there is the leak. So we've got multiple leaks on this evaporator. Now I've got the big blue sitting on everything else and we'll give it a few minutes because sometimes the big blue will even pick up leaks that the leak detector won't. I'm not seeing that at the moment. Same thing with this side. We'll let it sit for another 10 minutes and then look for any more micro clusters. But we got two leaks, one on each circuit of this evaporator coil. Well, one on each side of the evaporator coil. There's actually four circuits, so. This side has got leaks all over the place. I think we might be picking one up right there, possibly. 
There's definitely one right there. There's definitely one over here. I can hear this one popping right down there. So they've got, this is the other coil now, so they've got leaks all over the place in this thing. And these are the leaks that I can see. We don't know if there's more. I was picking up something in this corner over here too, but I'm not seeing it, which makes me wonder if it's inside the coil. Yeah. Interesting. You gotta let the big blue do its magic. There it is. I knew I was picking one up in that corner. There's a leak right there too. So this coil has one, two, three, at least three leaks, and we still haven't done the other side or the actual coil itself. Okay, came over here. I'm not picking anything up on this one. It's kind of running through, nothing, nothing. Um, went ahead and went right over here, you know, run the bottom of the coil, looking good, okay no problems but right here I pick up leaks so the question is is that just picking up the leaks from the other side or is it leaking in here too see I think it's leaking in here too I think this one's gonna be a candidate for a new coil I will certainly give the customer the options and give them a repair quote but if I tell them I certainly think I could possibly repair that other coil because it's just two leaks on a braze joint but that coil is the same age as this one. These are from 2004. So, you know, their best bet is to change both coils, but you know, times are tight right now with this COVID stuff. So I don't know, we'll have to see, but I'm really gonna push them for at least one evaporator coil, at least. Cause this one, I can't guarantee anything. I mean, even that one, I'm not gonna guarantee anything, but I, I think I could fix the other one, you know. But again, it's their money. I'll let them make the decisions on what they wanna do. So I'm up on top of the box. There's a tiny, tiny little access hole, but luckily it's kind of closed in up here, so it's not too dirty. A uh, couple things. I'm going to do a leak search real quick on these lines. I'm not going to rip all the insulation off, but I'm going to poke a little couple holes. But look right there, guys. That's a liquid line solenoid valve up on top of this box. You can't just assume things. And installers, they never think of us. That's the stupidest place to put a solenoid. But it's cost effective, essentially, because they didn't have to run a return pipe from one coil to the other. The better bet would have been to run a liquid line to one coil, put a solenoid in a T, and then go to the other coil. Yeah, it's not the best piping practices, but it's the most practical for, you know, repairs and stuff. So we got to make sure that we know that there's a solenoid valve up here. But I'm going to do a quick leak search of these lines right here, just, just real quick, just to try to give them a big picture quote. All right, uh, we're gonna turn this guy back on. I've got to uh, turn the breaker off, put the Molex plug back in the compressor. Uh, I front seated the king valve on the receiver. So the compressor's gonna start up and the system's gonna pump down so I can check the liquid level in the receiver. Uh, I believe my technician filled it up to the three quarter level yesterday. So I will uh, double check that level and verify with him. And then we know if I need to add gas. I doubt I'm gonna have to because I don't think it leaked out anymore very much since yesterday. And also another thing I wanted to point out too, that you saw pretty big bubbles coming out of that evaporator coil, but I had the system pressures equalized. It's not gonna be, if ever, that you're gonna have 100 PSI suction pressure. You're typically gonna have about 30 psi suction pressure so it won't be leaking out as fast essentially because we have you know higher pressure basically creating a pressure differential pushing the gas out of those those leaks faster right now so let's pump it down and see where the liquid level is so i just got off the phone with my service tech and he did not fill it up to the three quarter level um he said that it was about halfway and that's right about where it is is this mark so i'm going to go ahead and fill it up to the three quarter level because we know that's the maximum amount of gas we can put in here this way it lasts longer until the customer can uh, uh, approve my quote to repair it basically. So we're gonna add some gas. So I'm kind of cheating. Um, I didn't open up the king valve and I'm slowly adding gas to the system, but I gotta be careful because you don't wanna flood the compressor. So I still have it pumped down. I'm adding it through a Schrader though, so, but we're just going a little bit at a time, making sure it doesn't shut off again. I have the, actually I won't shut off because I have the pressure control bypass. So 
So I'm taking a shortcut, but there's consequences to this shortcut. If I put too much liquid refrigerant in there, I could ruin the compressor. Um, you know, you can cause issues. So you gotta, if you're gonna take shortcuts, you need to really know the consequences and understand how to prevent them. All right, we can clearly see the temperature right here. 105, and then as you go down, it's gonna drop and temp, drop, 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 drop. Okay, so my liquid level, though, I'm feeling it with my hands, the, the extreme heat is right here. So um, we're gonna go ahead and mark this at the three-quarter level. Okay, so we're gonna mark our liquid level right here. Um, and then uh, that way we know. So let's talk about this liquid level here. Why are we doing this? Well, because our unit has a head pressure control valve. Head pressure control valve is there to flood the condenser in the lower ambient temperatures when it's winter basically, okay? And it maintains, the easiest way to explain it is it maintains the head pressure at a higher head pressure, okay? Now there's more to it, it's really about the pressure differential at the expansion valve, but the easiest way to understand is the head pressure control valve keeps the head pressure up in the winter time, okay? Um, so with that being said, it floods the condenser, meaning it slows down the flow of refrigerant out of the condenser, sometimes stops it, um, and allows liquid refrigerant to back up in the condenser. So if you think about it, like I said, the easiest way to explain it is it's uh, raising the head pressure. It's similar to blocking off the condenser, but not the same, but it's the same concept, okay? Blocking off the condenser, bringing up the head pressure, okay? But when we do that with refrigerant by flooding, we need extra refrigerant in the system, okay? We call that the winter charge. Uh, notice something too, guys, while I'm talking to you, this is actually leaking oil because it leaks, these king valves always leak. So you see the oil on the ground? So, but anyways. Um, so the, the head pressure control valve, when it floods the condenser, it needs extra refrigerant, okay? We call that the flooded charge or another term for it is the winter charge. Now I'm starting to get a little bit frustrated with the winter charge term because people are confusing that, thinking that you add extra gas in the winter. No, that's not what you do. It's the extra gas that's always sitting in the system for the winter time, okay? Kind of semantics, but people seem to really need the simplest explanation. So it's not gas that you come in and put in in the winter and remove in the summer. No, 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 no. You're thinking of it wrong, okay? It's the gas that's gonna be used in the winter. In the summertime, it just sits in the receiver waiting to be used, that's all, okay? So, we add the extra gas. Now, the best way to add that refrigerant is use the Sporlin method, uh, or actually the best way is to lean on the manufacturer, okay? So if we come over here, this manufacturer, we have it written right here, has actually told us that System A takes 14.4 pounds, uh, let's see if I can get you guys a better look. System A takes 14.4 pounds of gas when it's fully charged, okay? That's from the manufacturer. But here's my problem. I had a service tech here yesterday and he came out to the system. Okay, we know it needs 14.4 pounds, but how do we know is left? how much is left in the system? We don't, okay? So my tech came yesterday, he filled it up to about the halfway mark, okay, when it was pumped down. And I came out today, but I don't know where he put it. Again, not knowing how much refrigerant's in the system because he didn't mark it, okay? so. I'm going to mark this at the three-quarter level while it's pumped down, so that way the next guy knows that's where I left the refrigerant charge. Now, the other method to do, and actually, this is what the manufacturer of this rack, Kyrak, did, was use the Sporlin 90-30-1 method where they calculated the flooded charge. All that they do is figure out how much internal volume the condenser has. They figure out how much they want to flood the condenser as a percentage-wise, okay? That, that's affected by the ambient temperatures and they add the extra refrigerant. So that calculated charge they gave us, 14.4 pounds, that's the total charge um, for a predetermined line set, usually about 50 to 100 feet, plus the flooded charge, okay? So, now, hopefully I'm not losing you guys, but I'm gonna mark this liquid level for the next guy, okay? That way they know we left it at three quarters, and we'll give the customer a quote to repair this system. All right, had a few tidbits of information in here. Now, important thing to understand is remember, my videos are meant to be just another source of information. It's not the golden rule. You don't have to follow everything in my videos, and I'm not telling you how to do your job, okay? These are just the ways that I approach certain situations. Certainly, uh, when I started the leak search, I was saying, hey, you know, don't put gauges on the system. That's just one method, and I do that for a certain reason, so that way I can leak search 
the points at which I'm gonna access the system because sometimes you walk up to a system and there may be a small leak at the king valve cap, like the the, the actual cap that goes over the, um, the stem for the king valve. And when you take the cap off or when you start adjusting the king valve, you may inadvertently fix that leak. Or maybe it's leaking at the quarter inch cap where you're gonna put your service gauge. And when you put your gauge on there, your hose on there, you don't, you know, you fix the leak. So that's why I'm saying, you know, start if you can, but there, there's a lot of variables that go into that. You have to know the system has gas in it. There's no point in leak searching a system if it doesn't have any gas, you know? So you got to understand how the system works and use your, your brain power to know whether or not that's a good method. Certainly, you could simply put your gauges on a system right away, equalize out the gauges and call it a day and you'll have, you'll have pressure on each side of the system, okay? But you also have to pay attention because depending on what you're working on, if you work on some supermarket style systems, if you work on um, uh, fish cases, deli cases, there might be suction line solenoid valves and liquid line solenoid valves, okay? I've seen it. So, you know, assuming equalizing your gauges out is gonna pressurize the evaporator is not always the truth, so you need to understand how the system operates, okay? Um, if you have a liquid line solenoid valve and a suction line solenoid valve and the, you turn off the power to the system and you think you're leak checking the evaporator, you could be wasting your time because there's no gas in it or not enough gas in it, okay? So you really need to research. And this isn't just a follow a video and, and go become an HVAC service technician. That's not how this works, okay? Um, now, I certainly realize that people that are not experienced in HVAC watch my videos. And I certainly realize that some business owners and homeowners watch them. And, and that's great, okay? And no offense to anybody, but these videos are meant for service technicians. Um, you know, uh, someone has to be pretty... Um, you know, intuitive if they're going to watch my videos, never working on a refrigeration system and then work on one. Okay. The, you know, I try to leave out some of the core information. So that way, you know, I'm not, um, empowering everybody to go out and work on their systems. First off, there's a lot of safety reasons, but you know, of course I don't want to take any other contractors jobs or anything like that. So anyways, that's a whole tangent. Um, I said it in the beginning of the video. I'll say it again. If you guys haven't already, do me a favor and go check out my website, hvacrvideos.com. Uh, lots of cool merch available. Um, I'm wearing the zip up hoodie sweatshirt right now. Uh, the hats, beanies, uh, shirts. And I said in the beginning too, you know, a lot of people don't realize that I have women's cut uh, v-neck t-shirts on there too. So they fit differently. They're actually women's sizes in them. And my wife says that the sizes are very true to the actual size, if that makes sense. I don't know what that really means, but, um, so, uh, check it out. HVACRvideos.com. So about this video too, you know, um, doing the leak search, you cannot just stop at the first leak guys. Okay. Don't do that. Remember, these videos are made for my employees, so I'm literally talking to my employees. You find a leak, you keep going, okay? Yes, there's certain situations where the leak is so big that you can't find any other leaks, okay. But in my situation, we had very small leaks, and I'm gonna be honest with you. My service tech had to put 10 pounds of gas in this the day before, okay? Um, to be honest with you, I don't think I found leaks that would equate to 10 pounds of gas being lost. So that kind of makes me a little anxious. So that's why I went above and beyond to climb on top of the box, look at the rack because we're leak checking the whole system. You got to make sense of this guys. Okay. Um, and experience tells me that yes, these leaks, they could have been leaking for a very long time. And that's probably what happened was it's been slowly leaking out and it finally hit the breaking point where the temps just hit the fan, you know? And, uh, and it became an issue, but you, you gotta, you know, use logic. You don't just go into this, um, again, here we go. Don't go into this with your blinders on and your headphones on and just think you're going to go to work and just pass the time. This is a job that you need to invest yourself in. Okay. Um, if you guys are coming to work every day, punching a time card and bouncing and not thinking about anything else, you may survive, but you're not advancing yourself and you're not bettering yourself. Okay. You need to be invested in this job. You need to have your head in the game. Okay. Um, if you guys have personal stuff going on at home, I know it's hard to let that go. Take a couple days off, get yourself into a position where you can come to work and focus on work. Okay. So, you know, I'm just trying to say you need to really understand and make sense of what's going on and think logically. Okay. You know what? I found a leak, but that doesn't seem like you know, it's a big enough leak. There's nothing better to a service manager's or an owner's ear when a tech calls them and says, hey man, you know, I found some leaks, but dude, for the amount of gas that I had to put into this and the leaks that I found, it doesn't really add up. 
You know what that means to a service manager and a business manager or business owner, whatever, a lead? That means, hey man, this guy is thinking, okay? He's really using his brain power and he's really concerned about this job and he is invested in this job. So guys, do your due diligence, okay? Think about the job, be concerned about the customers, right? I went to the customer while I was doing this and I was keeping him in the loop the entire time I was filming this video. Hey, you know what? I'm here because he, my service tech was there today before. And I said, Hey, I'm here because you know, um, this thing lost a lot of gas and I want to look for this leak because this concerns me. I showed him that I had concern. And then as I was leak searching, you know, I had to go get something from my van. I walked up to the customer again. Hey man, you know, um, I found a couple leaks, but I'm not going to let it go at that because I want to make sure that that's all that there is, you know, so I'm going to keep looking again. I'm just keeping him in the loop. I'm making him feel comfortable. I'm building confidence with him. Okay. And I'm showing him that I'm invested in his business. All right. I'm, I'm genuinely invested and concerned and I want to do the best that I can for my customer. Okay. Building that confidence. There's nothing better than building confidence with a customer. Okay. Building a relationship. So when I was all, or when all was said and done, I went to the customer and I said, look, we found multiple refrigerant leaks and both evaporator coils. Um, and I said, look, I'm going to get a hold of your facilities department and I'm going to give them all the information and let them make the decisions. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, by doing that, uh, I'm also, again, this is very customer specific information I'm going to give right now. Okay. Some customers want a lot of information. Other customers don't want a lot of information. Okay. So you have to be very guarded and understand and communicate with your management staff to know how you're supposed to communicate with the customers because this particular restaurant customer, um, I need to be careful about the information that I share with certain people in the company. And that is uh, by the people that I work for, I've been told, be cautious, okay, um, and and just share what needs to be shared, essentially, okay? And I'm not going to go into too much more detail, but basically the people that employ me in this business kind of dictate what information I communicate, okay? And that's all that I'm going to say there. So um, I have to know that. And when I go to the customer and share information, I have to be careful because, you know, the people that are employing me, directly paying me, have told me, hey, keep, you know, certain information between certain people. Okay. All right. I just do what I'm told. It's a game that you have to play within this industry. So, um, probably shared a little bit too much information there, but oh, well, it is what it is. So I really, really appreciate you guys watching these videos. And, and again, it's still very humbling, you know, uh, these, these babbling that I do at the end and sharing and talking and, you know, going on my rants and stuff. It's very humbling to know that people actually listen to the end of here. Um, we are creeping again. Thank you guys so much. We are creeping up on the hundred thousand subscriber mark. If you haven't already, please, please go consider subscribing to the channel. It's just one of those things. It really doesn't mean anything, but it's just that milestone that you want to hit. I think I'm like a couple hundred subscribers away from a hundred thousand. So it's really cool. Um, again, like I said, it doesn't change anything, you know, it's, it's still, and, and to be honest with you, it's not even about the subscribers, you know, it's really about the views that you get and all that stuff. But anyways, I'd love to creep over that number. So if you guys haven't already, please consider go subscribe. Um, Remember, I do live streams on Monday evenings, 5 p.m. Pacific on YouTube, where I talk about these videos. Um, also go live on the HVAC Overtime channel on Friday evenings about 6.05 p.m. with my buddies, uh, Adam, Bill, and Joe, and we just kind of hang out and talk about the week. Um, and it can be pretty random what we talk about. It's very uncensored. Um, so uh, it be, be, be prepared if you go to that. And uh, I think, to be honest with you, I am the most uncensored person on that show. Uh, to be honest with you, I probably irritate the guys with the way that I talk. And um, it's it's almost like a relief. Like, you know, uh, it's just my group of guys that I go to hang out with. And man, I just sometimes I, at the end of the show, I think, God damn, why did I talk about that? Oh, my gosh, what did I say? You know, so but it's just a cool hangout. We usually have a couple beers and just hang out and talk. So definitely go check out the HVAC Overtime Show. Um, also, okay, please, if you guys are considering any tool purchases, check out truetechtools.com. Okay. I have an offer code set up with them. Big picture, one word. If you use that offer code, you will save 8% on your order and I get a small cut, a small commission, basically. Okay. It doesn't cost you anything else. Um, also, if you guys have a specific tool in mind that you want to purchase, send me an email, hvacrvideos at gmail.com, and I can generate an affiliate link that will help me out just a little bit more. Okay. Just a way to help support the channel. So really, really appreciate you. And we will catch you on the next one.